If I had to pick one Bible doctrine that was the cause of the most argumentation and debate and conflict all through the centuries, it would be the doctrine of the Trinity. In the next half hour, together we will take a close look at the mysterious Holy Trinity as spoken in God's Word. Please join us. Greetings, dear friends. My name is Marvin Clark. And I'm Judy Clark. And today we are going to cover the very interesting subject of the Trinity. You know, Judy, the Trinity has been and continues to be a subject of incredible debate from day one, clear through to today, and maybe until Jesus comes, people will be debating that subject. And I never, I will not, I never have, never will get into arguments about any biblical subject because nobody ever wins. All you do is make enemies. And that's not what the Bible's about. No. So uh, we're not in any kind of an argumentative mode tonight, not trying to convince you of anything. What we will do regarding the subject of the Trinity is to see what the Bible says about it, and we'll stay right there. Fair enough? All right. Sounds wise. Here we go. The points of debate on the subject of the Trinity are basically these. Uh, what form does the Holy Spirit take? If you were looking at the Holy Spirit, what, would you see something there? Would you see somebody there? Or is it an invisible force? The other is uh, regarding Jesus, and it goes like this. Was Jesus a created being, or was he with God from eternity? Uh, is he eternal like the Father, or was he created? And then the last one, is there one entity called God? or three separate entities when you're talking about the Trinity or the Godhead. Those are basically the uh, issues, and we're not going to uh, go any farther than what the Bible says, so let's jump in there and see what the Bible says. Let's begin with the verses that, that say that God is one. All right, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. Uh, the one from the Old Testament is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. And it simply says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. One God. And Judy, you have the 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, the New Testament uh, corresponding one to the one I read. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4? As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. And there it is again. There is one God. Now, some people take that and run with it and say, see, there's just one God. So there's only Jesus. There's no God the Father. There's no Holy Spirit. Everything is wrapped up into Jesus. But I have a little bit of a challenge with that, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Uh, Thirty-five years ago, you and I stood in front of a pastor down in San Diego, California. Remember that day? Ah, it's been that long. Yeah, 35 years ago. 30? Unreal, unbelievable, 35 years back. Mm -hmm. And that pastor looked at you, and he looked at me, and said, Judy and Marvin, you are too. But in just a minute, in just a moment, you too are going to become one. Mm -hmm. Two flesh into one flesh. And for 35 years, we have been one flesh. Remember when the teenagers painted the Volkswagen and they put <laughs> one plus one equals one? I like and that. And people would stop us and ask us, why did they do that? Because that's not mathematically correct. That yellow Volkswagen Beetle, we took our honeymoon in. You're right. We were working with the youth back in San Diego and those kids found our car. We tried to hide it. Didn't hide it very good. They found it. They stuffed it full of newspapers, wadded up newspapers, and they wrote on the window, just like you said, <laughs> one plus one equals one. And that's what we're talking about right now. They didn't know 35 years later 
we'd be talking about this on television. But we are. So, two becoming one. How in the world does that work? Now, you teach your children in your third and fourth grade classroom all kinds of different Bible topics. How in the yes. world would you handle this one? How can you show them that three are one, but yet one are three? It's so much fun because they're visual, visual learners. And one of the easiest ways to do that is with an egg. How many parts are in an egg? I only see one part. But when you crack it and the contents flow out, how many parts are there? You've got the shell, you've got the white, and that uh, yolk. And how many parts is that? That's three parts. And three parts together make one whole. Aha. Uh -huh. And they get it. But see, I'm working with children. They see, they believe. And adults try to make something bigger <laughs> out of it than it is, don't we? Yes, I don't have those kind of issues. They accept it because God created the egg. And when they see the three parts, they know that God in all of the forms love each other so much that they're as one. Hey, maybe that's why that God says in the book that unless we become like a little child, yes. we won't even enter into heaven. Maybe he's trying to tell us something. Whenever there's something that a child does not understand and I cannot help them to have clarity of mind, I'll just say, just wait till we get to heaven and Jesus teaches you that. Then with a heaven mind and with heaven eyes, you'll see amazing wonders you've never even dreamed. And you'll be satisfied. When we hear it from the master, we'll all be satisfied. But your kids are satisfied right now. Oh, that we yes. had that mind of a child sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then when I tell them, I say, do you want to learn a scientific term that high schoolers learn? And of course, they want to. They want to be that advanced. And I say, and do you like shortcuts? Oh, love shortcuts. Well, do I have one for you? When you spell water, how many letters are in the word water? You have W-A-T-E-R. You have five letters. But I can show you a three letter that shows that all the components of water are put together in one term. And they learn the shortcut h 2 Oh. Ah. And as we take, we talk about the parts of water, but when you go to get a drink of water, do you see those three parts? You don't. But together, they become the water that we drink and consume. Aha. Uh -huh. I heard you give an illustration the other day about H2O and how it, was, it can be found in three different uh, ways, three different capacities? Oh, yes. Um, steam. They water can love be steam. Water to be like steam. Okay. Then there's um, ice, the form of ice, and then there's also the liquid water that they drink or take their showers or um, play in. Yeah, and, and they're three in one. Yes. Just like the egg, so it's one H two O, but it can be in three different forms. Yes. One egg, three different parts of it. One God, three entities making up that one God. Yes. Okay. Let's look at a verse or two that mentions all three members of the Godhead together. Uh, if you can get the Matthew 28, 19, and 20, I'll do the Matthew 3, all 16, right. and 17. Two places in the Bible that mention all three members of the Godhead uh, in one place at one time. Okay? Wow. Let's check it out. First of all, the baptism of Jesus. Okay? Jesus getting baptized by John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3, 16 and 17. Here's how the King James read. And Jesus, when he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water. That means he was down in the water, by the way before he came up out of the water, which is significant because it tells us 
what kind of a baptism Jesus experienced. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and lighting on him. Here's two people. Jesus getting baptized, Holy Spirit, or two entities. Verse 17, watch this. Here comes a third. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, here's a voice coming from heaven speaking now, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus getting baptized, Holy Spirit coming down, landing on his head like a dove, and God speaking down from heaven, all three members of the Godhead together, one place, one time. Yes. How about the one in Matthew 28, 19 and 20? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. All right, what a promise from Jesus. Yes. So when I baptize people, and you've seen me do many of those, uh, probably yes. hundreds now in the last 35 years, I baptize them like it says there because it's pretty plain. Baptize them in the name of the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So I'm careful to do that. So I have no problem, Judy, believing that even though the Bible says that, that God is one, that there are three separate entities in that oneness, like the egg, like the H2O. And so uh, it just it makes good sense. I think we can support that teaching from the Bible. And I think that's so important when you keep referring back to the Bible. Because as we have stated earlier, that the Bible is God's inspired word. And if we really search and prayfully ask God, you know, teach us what it is that you want me to know, he will honor that request. And it sounds like this is a great place to begin. It's a great place to begin and a great place to end. Yes. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. Dear friends, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. You can bet your life on the Word of God. And that's exactly what Christians have done. Let's yes. look at a passage or two where all three members of the Godhead uh, were involved. And we can go to a creation week in the book of Genesis and then to the New Testament in John chapter 1, verse 1 and 14. First of all, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Check this out. The first verse in the entire Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form, it says, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now watch this. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here's, here's God with the Holy Spirit involved in creation. And wait till you see this verse that Judy's going to read because the third member of the Godhead is obviously involved also. John 1, verse 1, and then 14. Starts out very similar like yours did. Yes. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And down to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Mm. So clearly, in verse 14, it explains who the Word was in verse 1. If all we had was verse 1, we might not know who that Word was that was in the beginning with God. But verse 14 tells us, that's Jesus. Mm, Jesus was that Word, the Word made flesh. That was He. Now, th there's a neat passage in the Bible that talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. And it, th the context of it is that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. 
Nicodemus was, was a high up person in the uh, Jewish religious world. And he had seen Jesus. He had been attracted to the teachings of Jesus. He had watched Jesus do miracles. And he wanted to know more about him. He wanted to find out what spiritually Jesus was all about. Because he wanted an experience that Jesus had been teaching. And that was the born again experience. Let's find out about it. It's in John chapter 3. The headline is, Jesus Talks with Nicodemus. Here we go. Uh, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. Uh, he came to Jesus at night because he didn't want to be seen by any of his friends, his religious friends, because Jesus was so controversial. So he, he, he had a sneak meeting. He had a private meeting with Jesus in the dark. And he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do those miracles that you do except God be with him. Now, he's kind of wanting to flatter Jesus here. He's kind of trying to build him up to get on his side. But Jesus is not swayed by flattery or anything else. So watch what happens now. <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto him, gets right to the point. He nails Nicodemus, not paying any attention to the uh, trying to build him up or flatter him, he gets right to the point when he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, that man cannot see the kingdom of God. Whoa. That threw Nicodemus. Well, that that pushed him back us. a step or two. He wasn't ready for that. He was a religious leader. And here's, here's somebody coming and saying, You need to be born again. Let's see what Nicodemus' reaction is. Verse 4. John chapter 3. Nicodemus saith unto him, Well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Now Jesus answers back, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, here it is again, just flat right in his face, except a man be born of water and born of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So marvel not, Nicodemus, that I said unto you, you must be born again. Now, watch in the next verse what Jesus does. He draws a beautiful um, parallel here between the Holy Spirit and the wind. Verse 8, the wind blows where it listeth, and you can't hear the sound thereof. You can't tell where it came from. You can't tell where it's going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? So Jesus compares the Holy Spirit to the wind, and I can see why. I guess anybody can see why. We can see the results of the wind, but we can't see the wind. That's true. We can't. It's like electricity, and you tell a child... Don't put your finger in that socket. So then we buy all of these plug-in adapters to protect them from it because we know that there is something in there that transfers to the child, which is the electrical current. You can't see it. But if you stick your finger in there or something else in there, you experience You're gonna feel it. that electricity. <laughs> and then you know there is a thing called electricity. Yep. And the same would occur with if you had a fan going and you took some confetti and you threw it at the fan, what would the fan do with the confetti? Uh-huh. It's going to throw it all over the floor. It would. And how did it get there? By something you can't see, but you can only see the results of. That's the fan. That's the Holy Spirit. Uh-huh. I can see that you probably every day in your classroom, draw these, these visuals to help the children understand the spirituals. And we need to. When we are in everyday situations with them, we need to share these little tidbits of God's Word with them because they are so willing and ready to absorb truth that is shared with them when it is done in a natural setting while you're going around, something as simple as showing, you know, we 
don't want you to put your hand in there because there's a thing called electricity. This is why we're putting the cap on there. But we want you to know that, you know, God has a, a Holy Spirit that he sends to us. You can't see it, but you will experience it. Absolutely. As you picked up by now, I'm sure, we, Judy and I, are trying our best to make this a family-friendly program each week, a family-friendly program, so your children can be taught the things that uh, we're sharing with you that are pretty heavy and pretty big. I mean, the Trinity is a huge, heavy, and big Bible teaching. But you have the ability, by the grace of God, to help children understand it with something as simple as an egg. Can you imagine you're fixing breakfast and you take an egg out and ask who wants an egg for breakfast and then as you get ready to prepare it you tell them no this reminds me of something that I was reading in the Bible you know kind of reminds me of the Holy Spirit and God and God the Father and you know we talk about the three together as one you can basically ask the child, just like we began earlier in the show, that how many parts are in an egg? This is how much God loves you, that he has three ways to love you to the utmost. Beautiful way to state it. Three ways to love you. <laughs> that is good. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. When I drive by your school sometimes during the day, uh, I see you and the students out in the garden. Now, yes. that is so neat. Here's a teacher out there in the garden with her students pulling those weeds, planting plants, picking the produce, taking it into your cafeteria and, and uh, eating what yes. the kids have grown. This is amazing and it is so neat. Uh, I'm going to take a shot in the dark here, but I would predict that you probably have connected those weeds that they pull out between the plants with sins in the life? Is that a possibility? Oh, very possibility. And even as they get their garden growing and they start realizing that there's bugs that love to creep in and destroy, and you can talk about you know, that also, that those things Jesus wants to pull out of our life to make us happy. And he gives us three helpers to help that ha occur. And that is, he has his son, he has his self, and he has the Holy Spirit to help. And you can do it in simple things as watering in the garden because without it, we all dry up and wrinkle. But yet when you have God's Spirit in you, we become alive. Beautiful. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Those kids are lucky. Well, I am. I feel like I'm blessed. All right. Um, characteristics of God whether they be God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 90, verse 1 and 2, it, it talks about the eternal nature of God. Everything we have and hold and, and see and hear, Judy, has had a beginning. There was a time in history when this Bible did not exist. There was no Bible here. But one day it was made in a factory, and now I'm holding it in my hand. Everything we have, uh, the pen that we write with, the pencils that your kids draw with, everything has a beginning and eventually will have an end. The Bible will wear out. This pen will run out of ink and, and probably break sometime. The pencil, I know the kids uh, sh keep sharpening and sharpening until they're just <laughs> tiny, even yes. one inch. But one day it will run out and be gone. Yes. So not so with God, though. Amazing. God has no beginning and no end. I can't understand it. That's going to be one of the questions I ask him when I get there. But Psalm 90, verse 1 and 2 says, uh, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world. Here it comes. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. I can't understand that. I can't even come close to grasping it. In fact, if you deal with it long enough in your mind, you start to go nuts. At least I do. So I can't, I have to stop it. Eternity is, is too much of a concept to even embrace. But someday, he's going to explain it to us. Praise God. Yes. So God is eternal. And I found that, he, that uh, Jesus is the same. 
Jesus had no beginning and no end. He was from eternity. So they've been around <laughs> since day one and way before. They'll be around at the end, and there is no end. So God is eternal. No beginning, no end. Don't ask me to explain it. He, besides being eternal, he, he's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at once. I don't know anybody else that's like that, but God is. In Psalm 139, we read, O Lord, you have searched me. You've known me. You know my downsitting. You know my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. He understands our thoughts before we even think them. You compasseth my path and my lying down, and you're, you're uh, acquainted with all my ways. Nothing escapes him. For there's not a word in my tongue, O Lord, that you don't know altogether. You have beset me behind and before. You've laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful. It's high. I cannot attain to it. Amen to that. <laughs> no, we can't attain to it. So where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I free from your, flee from your presence? If I go to heaven, that's where you are. If I, make, if I make my bed in hell, you're there too. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. God is eternal. God is everywhere. And there's three parts to him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I'm sure glad they're all there because the Holy Spirit lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in me. And God would have the Holy Spirit live in you as well. It's in the Bible.